Good afternoon. My name is Tom Bruner, and I'm the president and CEO of Glaucoma Research Foundation. Welcome to our webinar, an exclusive update, working together to solve neurodegeneration. This webinar is a special thank you to our donors for your support of Glaucoma Research Foundation and our mission to restore vision. Glaucoma Research Foundation partnered 20 years ago with the Stephen and Michelle Pierce Foundation to establish the first Catalyst for a Cure research initiative. Our idea was to create a unique approach to research that would foster innovative thinking by bringing together four principal scientists from four different universities with specific areas of expertise to collaborate on curing glaucoma. The first Catalyst for Cure team worked together for 11 years and redefined glaucoma by focusing on the earliest molecular events of the disease and showing that glaucoma shares many similarities with other neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Based on the success of the first consortium, a second Catalyst for a Cure research team launched in 2012 to identify new biomarkers for glaucoma that would provide better ways to detect and measure the disease in patients before vision is lost. Building on the discoveries made by the first two teams, a third consortium was formed in 2019 to restore vision lost due to glaucoma. This team has made incredible progress and is planning to launch their first clinical trial on neuroprotection to slow and stop vision loss. The success of Catalyst for a Cure and the discoveries made by each team have now inspired a fourth consortium. Our dear friends, Ted and Melza Barr, were major supporters of the first Catalyst for a Cure team, as well as many other research projects over the past 20 years. Last year, they approached us with the idea of expanding our research efforts to include other neurodegenerative diseases that might reveal new therapeutic targets to protect, repair, or regenerate nerve cells lost in glaucoma. I am proud to say, thanks to the Melza M. and Frank Theodore Barr Foundation, we have been able to launch our fourth Catalyst for a Cure initiative to prevent and cure neurodegeneration. We have assembled a scientific advisory board of experts in neurodegeneration and regenerative medicine who selected an outstanding team of scientists. This new team that will harness multidisciplinary, collaborative, and integrative approaches to develop breakthrough strategies to prevent and cure neurodegeneration across diseases, and specifically to prevent loss of visual function and restore vision in glaucoma. It is now my honor to introduce Dr. Adriana DiPolo, Chair of the Catalyst for a Cure Scientific Advisory Board. She is a professor of neuroscience at the University of Montreal in Canada, a Schaefer Grant Prize winner, and a member of the Schaefer Grant Advisory Committee. Dr. DiPolo will be joined by Dr. Shane Littelau, who is also on the Catalyst for a Cure Scientific Advisory Board. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience, Physiology, and Ophthalmology at New York University Langone Health Center. Please welcome Adriana and Shane. Thank you so much, Tom, for that very kind introduction. And it is such a pleasure for me to be here today to introduce the other members of the Scientific Advisory Board and to tell our viewers today about this new Catalyst for a Cure team. So it, it has really been a tremendous privilege and honor for me to, to chair this initiative 
And uh, it was a team effort in joining me in selecting the team where uh, Dr. Gurjun Bu from the Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Sally Temple from the Neural Stem Cell Institute, and Dr. Shane Lidlow, as uh, Tom just mentioned, from New York University. And so uh, we uh, selected these individuals based not only on their incredible dedication and talent scientifically, but they bring a unique expertise, also multidisciplinary, that we think is ideal for this particular initiative to prevent and cure not only glaucoma, but extend it to other neurodegenerative diseases. Yes, yeah, so now I'm going to let my colleague, um, Sean Lidlow, Dr. Lidlow, introduce uh, the first member of our team, uh, uh, Sandro Damesquita. So uh, thank you both to Tom and to Adriana. It's been, a, as, uh, as they both mentioned, we really tried to bring together some of the uh, youngest and brightest minds in a range of different fields to tackle this uh, notion of commonalities uh, of pathology and possible commonalities of therapies across a range of neurodegenerative diseases, including glaucoma. And so Adriana, uh, Boo, Sally, the members of the Scientific Advisory Board were really trying to come up with a, a, a complementary um, but non-overlapping team of experts. And one of the members that came up very early in our search was uh, Dr. Sandra de Mesquita, who's now at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. Um, as you can see, he's a native of Portugal. He actually trained with one of the, uh, the world's top neuroimmunologists um, at uh, University of Virginia School of Medicine. And he really brings this neuroimmunological side to this neurodegeneration puzzle. And some of his most recent research has really uncovered not only the way that immune cells interact with cells within the brain and the retina, but also how the blood vasculature uh, and, and the clearance of toxic metabolites could be playing a role. So our next, uh, the next uh, member of the team that we want to introduce today is Milica Margheta from Harvard University. She's clinician scientist, currently an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the Mass Eye and Ear Research Institute. And from the very beginning, we all knew because glaucoma is such a central interest of the Glaucoma Research Foundation, of course, and all of us as scientists, we identified the need to have a clinician scientist specialized in glaucoma in this initiative. And we found uh, that uh, all the qualities in uh, Dr. Margheta, she is a dedicated clinician scientist that sees uh, glaucoma patients and has a lot of expertise regarding their needs, the clinical needs and, and what is needed in the field to advance treatments for glaucoma. She, has, she did a stellar uh, training at Stanford University uh, both for her PhD and uh, also medical degree. And then she did her ophthalmology residence and glaucoma fellowship at, at Duke University. And what is interesting uh, about Dr. Margheta is that she already leads a very successful uh, research program in glaucoma, but she also combines some aspects of Alzheimer's disease research in her focus by looking at specific cells like microglia uh, that Shane is going to discuss a little, little later on and how and what are the con possible connections between glaucoma and Alzheimer's disease in this regard. And then I'll just say a few uh, words about um, Dr. Karthik Shikar, who is now actually based at uh, UC Berkeley, so part of the University of California system in the Bay Area. He actually uh, did his uh, training in chemical engineering when he was in Bombay in India, and then transitioned over to computational and analytical side of research with his postdoc at um, MIT and also Harvard. And Karthik really brings together this idea of modern high throughput uh, analysis of very complex data sets that uh, a lot of people like Adriana, myself, and other members of the SAB are generating in our own labs. And he's really looking at not only comparative analyses of how individual patients may be responding 
uh, to disease and therapies, but also across a number of different animal models that may get used in a laboratory setting. In respect of neurodegenerative disease, one of the reasons we were really excited about Karthik's uh, not only technical abilities that he could bring to the team, but also he's uh, been a major player in some really important studies that looked at selective vulnerability of different neurons to injury, diseases, and insults. And it was also generated a transcriptomic or genetic atlas of the human eye, which is a really important point uh, for us moving forward, particularly given our uh, focus on glaucoma as part of CFC4. And then I will just wrap up this, the presentation of the team by introducing Dr. Hamsa Venkatesh. Uh, she is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. And again, she is a rising star in her uh, field of research. Uh, and also, uh, we are very particularly very uh, proud to have uh, recruited her for this team because she really brings the multidisciplinary aspect that we were so much looking for uh, in having uh, come together between these individuals, which is that she really started in a very different area, which is uh, glial. Um, uh, to cancer biology and uh, malignant growth uh, and gliomas in the brain. And, uh, but she uh, presents uh, herself as a person that uh, is multidisciplinary, has a ex very extensive knowledge of the neurosciences and brings both conceptual and technical uh, richness to the team. And you can see that she also has trained in the, in the best places around the country at the University of California, Berkeley and Stanford University. And again, her idea, her interest is in studying uh, the effect of microenvironments and how they may uh, change with uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, including glaucoma and Alzheimer's disease. So she will use what she has learned from uh, understanding how cancer grows in the brain and trying to apply some of these knowledge and, and lessons to trying to solve uh, the problem of glaucoma and neurodegeneration. So we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Venkatesh in, in this team. So as you can see, it's a very, uh, very diverse group of individuals with very different backgrounds, uh, very uh, different types of expertise. And we really are very proud to have uh, put together uh, the multidisciplinary aspect of, of these diseases, which uh, we think are going to really allow them to make significant progress over the next few years. I will let Shane talk a little bit about the process and, and how exciting it was to see them uh, get together for the first time. Yeah, so this, this is actually a really exciting point. One of the greatest uh, things that we get to do as scientists is sit down together and determine uh, missing pieces of information in puzzles like how do we cure neurodegeneration, um, but also uh, uh, have some com combative sort of nature between us as we do try and determine which is the best approach and, and which may not be the most appropriate approach for any particular question. And obviously COVID has meant that a lot of this has happened online, but we were very, very fortunate that just last week, actually, Adriana, uh, Booz uh, and myself, other members of the SAB, members of the Bar Family Foundation and the Glaucoma Research Foundation, as well as all four members of our CFC4 team were able to get together in person and have exactly this sort of discussion. And it was really exciting to see all members of the CFC4 team uh, knitting together, coming up with, uh, with their own hypotheses and novel ideas that they would investigate together collaboratively as a team, drawing on the strengths that they all bring together. Um, there was some uh, um, uh, people a little bit uh, concerned at the start that maybe they weren't the right fit for the team, but then as we pointed out to them, we have an excellent cell biologist, an excellent computational biologist, an excellent clinician, and an excellent immunologist who together have all the tools, expertise, and extreme intelligence to attack this problem from a new angle, which is something that the field has really needed. And so here's just some photos of, of them, more so than Adriana and I, hard at work last Friday uh, for many, many hours going through exactly these sorts of problems. And now the conversation is set to continue 
online, by email, and with our sort of continued uh, meetings throughout the years. Thank you, Shane. And, and the Scientific Advisory Board is very proud and, and um, looking forward to participating in guiding these talented scientists achieve their goals in the context of this consortium. Can I have the next slide, please? So I just, we're just gonna take a couple of more minutes of your time to tell you a little bit about the conceptual aspect of the, this particular team uh, effort and, and a little bit of the history of how it came about. So about a year ago, uh, over a year ago in April, 2021, uh, the Glaucoma Research Foundation, along with the support of the Barr family, who have been such strong supporters of this initiative, and also the Bright Focus Foundation, uh, put together a group of about 20 or 25 scientists that work very actively in the field of neurodegeneration. And both Shen and I were lucky to be part of this group that spent about an entire day talking about the, uh, the mechanisms that are involved in neurodegenerative diseases and the concept that perhaps there are many underlying common mechanisms um, among diseases that appear very different superficially. So the, the whole concept of this team and what we've been talking about in one way or another for about a year and a half is the idea that although different neurodegenerative diseases such as glaucoma and Alzheimer's disease, for example, just to, to give you two very common uh, ailments, they appear superficially that they have different symptoms, different um, characteristics and features that affect the patients that are uh, affected by these diseases. We think, and, and many of our, our group and the, the recruited team thinks that there are mechanisms that are common that can be used to then develop therapeutic strategies and novel cures for these diseases based on the common features that these uh, disorders have. And so uh, this, we had this amazing day where we talked about this and there was a paper that came out of this uh, initiative that was published this year in a very prestigious journal called Molecular Neurodegeneration. And this is one of the figures that uh, we uh, published in this uh, review paper, uh, trying to summarize in a way all the different factors and, and elements that can contribute to the onset and progression of neurodegenerative diseases. So I'm not going to get into too many details because that it's, is not the point here, but the idea then, and this was uh, thank you, thanks to the uh, inspirational uh, suggestion of, of the Barr family again, to then put together a team that is going to actually experimentally test uh, these hypotheses. As you can see here, there's a number of factors that contribute to neurodegeneration. Of course, environmental factors, we know that age and lifestyle uh, issues play an important role, but there's a lot of other things, genetic contributions, metabolic factors, neuroinflammation and, and vascular as well. And uh, I, I will let Shane explain a little bit the focus of the team, but uh, there they have a very uh, interesting uh, angle that they will be using to, to tackle common mechanisms of neurodegeneration. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect segue, Adriana. And again, I, I apologize, there's a lot of information on this slide that is not of uh, importance to remember at all, but we wanted to really highlight this, and this came out of the discussions from this paper that Adriana uh, mentioned that was written together with a number of members of the SAB. And it really highlights that there's a lot going on is the take home message from this. And I'm sure some of these labels you've heard of before. I mean, anyone who is unfortunate like myself to have a family member or friend with Alzheimer's disease has probably heard of amyloid or has probably heard of tau. And people have probably heard of things like uh, axons and neurons and things like this. What we really realized when we were discussing this as a group and trying to understand whether or not there were commonalities between these different neurodegenerative diseases and where the gaps in the knowledge that the field collectively had, we realized that, of course, the vast majority of research and treatments to date have actually focused on neurons. 
And these are the cells that unfortunately die or degenerate, hence the term neurodegeneration, in the context of diseases like glaucoma and Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, many others. And we sort of realized that there's a growing uh, almost cottage industry of researchers that is showing that we shouldn't be focusing purely on the neurons, which are unfortunately the cells that are dying here, but we should also be focusing on those cells or those molecules that are driving the death of those neurons. And so this is how we came across the idea that neuroimmunology, the immune system, aging, these protective glial cells that can switch into neurotoxic states, and all of the pathological proteins that can be together in concert driving this dysfunction in the brain or driving the degeneration and the death of these neurons through no fault of their own. And so this is why we brought together this amazing group of members as part of CSC4 to not ignore the neurons, because of course I told you that some of our members, particularly Kathik, had been looking at susceptibility of neurons to drive um, the death of these cells but bring in other experts from outside that field, bring in our immunologists like we have with Sandro, bring in people with expertise with cancer biology and interactions with the immune cells in the brain like we have uh, in the team as well. And so this was sort of was our starting point for building this amazing team of experts um, who then came up with their own ideas of what they would like to investigate moving forward with the help of Adriana and myself and the rest of the FOB. Thank you so much, Shane. I think really that's a, a beautiful summary of, of the goal, of the main goal and focus of the uh, CFC4 team. And um, I think uh, we have completed our, our presentation and uh, we are now happy to take questions uh, as needed and uh, to continue discussing about this exciting initiative. Thank you, Adriana and Shane. Uh, that was very interesting and the graphics were quite helpful. I wanna also thank everyone who has submitted questions. And I would like to start the, dis the discussion uh, with a fairly basic question. Um, and this you, you sort of answered already, but maybe you could expand on why the two diseases, Alzheimer's and glaucoma, there are other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's or AOS, um, but could you comment on why these two seem to be a, a particularly good uh, area to, to attack initially? I will start and then I'll let Shane continue if he has something to add, but it's a really good question. And it, it seems superficially that it may appear a little bit arbitrary why we chose these diseases, but it is really not because uh, these two diseases are the leading cause, one of irreversible vision loss worldwide, as in glaucoma, and Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of cognitive deficits worldwide as well. So we're, we, we picked uh, two leading uh, causes of neurodegeneration in different systems, but <clears throat> uh, undoubtedly, uh, very prevalent diseases that affect millions of people worldwide and are is only going to probably increase over the next few years. So we wanted to tackle as many, uh, to, to tackle those diseases that are affecting a lot of people around the world. But perhaps more from the biological perspective, there's already some work that has been done both in Alzheimer's disease and glaucoma showing that there are some common features among these two diseases. So we can see, for example, in the literature, uh, and these dates from many, many years ago, there are some clinical studies, for example, demonstrating that there is retinal ganglion cell loss, the neurons that die in glaucoma, also in Alzheimer's disease patients, and that there are there is some accumulation of those uh, proteins that have been uh, reported to be very important for Alzheimer's disease, like amyloid beta and tau, as Shane was mentioning, in patients with glaucoma and in animal models of glaucoma. So we know already uh, from the start that there are some commonalities between these two diseases. Uh, we're not excluding other diseases. It is possible that the team is going to make uh, progress in other areas that will also include 
or their neurodegenerative diseases, but those two diseases appear to be the most natural link uh, in terms of, of study. I don't know, Shane, if you would like to add something more. Or yeah, I maybe I'll just something. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think Adriana, you have a, you have a really perfect summary there, and and we are all in the field appreciative that this is an extremely complex problem, even if you're looking at only one individual disease. And there is a precedent for picking diseases like Alzheimer's and glaucoma due to the sheer enormity of the problem, due to the large number of patients. But it was very apparent, even listening to our CFC4 team last week, that they were also thinking with a much broader scope than this and thinking about which is uh, an appropriate um, uh, disease for them to study, which are appropriate model systems, which can they use uh, in high throughput cell-based assays, which would be an important aspect of any movement towards drug company uh, uh, therapeutic screening. You know, one of the other diseases that came up in our discussions, of course, was neurofibromatosis, which is a, another uh, genetic mutation that drives vision loss, but actually is due to tumors in the optic nerve. So here we had, of course, bringing in our expertise in the CFC from cancer biology and cell biology to look at a very different initiation and propagation of disease that was leading to a very similar a phenotype or very similar deficit for patients, which was blindness. And of course, we had also discussed things like motor neuron disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. And one of the things that um, is very apparent in experts that are studying all of these individual diseases is that the environmental cues or the environmental drivers of these diseases can be very similar. Aging, for instance, is a risk factor for a large number of these diseases poor diet, poor sleep, uh, low exercise is of course a contributing factor regardless of the disease that we're discussing. But also more apparently, it is becoming very clear that the vast majority of the genes that can have mutations that we may all carry that can lead to these diseases are mostly expressed not in those neurons, but again, in these immune cells and in these supporting cells, these glia, regardless of the disease um, that patients are manifesting with. And so this sort of brings together again the idea that the CFC4 focusing on the supporting cells and the immune cell response across these diseases is probably going to give us a really exciting foray into this novel idea of commonalities of degeneration and, and hopefully we'll have the CFC4 team um, uncover some really exciting uh, novel therapeutic targets that could help the widest group of patients across diseases. So what about the, speaking of genetic aspects, uh, I know one of the things that, that comes up is APOE. And I'm just wondering um, if you can comment, I think that was a question that came in about the APOE gene um, and that's impact across these different neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, maybe this is me as well. Um, yes. So this is actually a really exciting question. And, uh, you know, APOE is, I think, a gene that a lot of people are familiar with, um, you know, particularly uh, not only obviously in the basic sciences fields, but also in the general public uh, through, through our press avenues. Um, there is a number of different types of this APOE gene, which um, individual humans can express. And um, you may have heard that there is a, uh, APOE4, people who have this form of APOE, which is APOE4, are very, very much more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. It's around a 12-fold increase in your um, likelihood of having disease. Most people will be APOE3, which is another form of the gene, um, which means that you have about the normal risk. And then there is an APOE2 form, which is a small proportion of the patients, uh, of people that carry some degree of protection or a lower risk of, of um, developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Shane, so has you anyone looked at um, the overlap uh, between glaucoma and Alzheimer's with this particular disease? Is that being looked at in glaucoma, for example? Yeah, that's an exciting one. So if we focus just on APOE4, it is really detrimental in uh, Western European populations, which is most of, them, of North America or the US, um, that actually makes them have a higher incidence of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it is called a risk gene. 
but in glaucoma, actually, ApoE4 can have a protective effect. And so we have the same protein or the same gene, which can have different effects here. And I just want to mention the reason I bring up Western European populations where ApoE4 is problematic is because there are some um, non-industrialized populations in Southern America there where actually ApoE4 is protective. Um, and so they have a vast majority of their populations are ApoE4 carriers, but they don't get Alzheimer's disease. So, of course, this is borne out in our um, uh, terrible historical uh, sort of trend of studying Western European populations rather than studying a more broad population of people from South America, Asia, uh, Eastern Europe and Africa, of course, as well. So it is right. a little complex and that's just one gene. Yeah, but right. it is interesting, sorry to interrupt, but it is interesting that ApoE4, which is detrimental for Alzheimer's disease and that, as you said, Shane, in Latin America, there's a less prevalence of of Alzheimer's disease, but if there's a higher prevalence of glaucoma in the in the Latino populations in, in South America, as well as uh, Black American and, and African of, of African origin. So the epidemiology and the genetic contribution is quite complex and uh, hopefully we'll understand a little better how these things are balanced out or uh, talk to each other with this ongoing research that the new team is going to so undertake. Thinking more broadly, um, because our commitment to these scientists is to fund them for three years based on the uh, research ideas they come up with and, and the results they get uh, year by year, and, and we'll be reporting on all of that. Um, but I guess, what what would you say would be a, a wonderful outcome? You know, what sort of what are your hopes um, and thoughts for what might be achieved in, with this initial three year effort looking at these uh, finding uh, common mechanisms for for these diseases and, and hopefully um, potential therapeutic targets? So have you thought about what you'd like to see? Uh, what would be the best uh, kind of outcome? Yes, if I can take a, 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 just a minute to talk about that. So we were giving these young scientists a very tall order uh, goal, which is to prevent and cure neurodegeneration. So I, I am sure having seen them uh, together last Friday that they're gonna give them their best shot for sure. They're really gonna try <laughs> to accomplish that. But realistically, I think it would be very, uh, very um, encouraging uh, if they just if they can just characterize some a handful of features that are common among these diseases, and I'm sure they're going to identify more than a handful because they're, they're as Shane was mentioning they're going to do uh, the screening of, of many many uh, different proteins and genes uh, that are going to change in in different models of disease and then they will validate them. And if they can identify a few that appear to be very uh, strong candidates, then they can move on to the phase that I think would be the most exciting where they can start screening for therapeutic compounds, perhaps more molecule or other, other, other type of, of uh, therapeutic uh, uh, drugs or targets that can modulate either the expression or the function of these uh, molecules and then modify or influence the outcome in these diseases. Of course, it will have to be first experimental models of glaucoma and Alzheimer's disease, but hopefully they will be able to uh, provide a very strong case, preclinical case, for a, a few of selected or, or you know, star candidates that can be then validated and, and maybe uh, move to clinical trials down the line. What do you think, Shane? Yeah, I, I agree. This is a tall order. Um, and now is not the time for making small steps. I and mean, we have a, an aging population, a growing population, uh, an impending need now, which is only going to get larger and larger uh, as time goes on. You know, I think we have to also be realistic here. You know, I don't think that in three years time, we will have a cure for all these diseases. I don't think that any one of us wants to be promising that. And I think none of the members of the CFC4, although we would hope for that beyond all hope, I think that it won't happen. 
Um, but one of the things that we we don't lack for in the scientific community is experts and intelligence. What we are lacking in these particular diseases is druggable targets. Um, you know, we can run through the gamut of trying to reduce, am reduce amyloid or tau or targeting alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's or trying to reduce intraocular pressure in glaucoma. And there's a lot of things that have been trialed both in the preclinical setting and clinical setting with mixed results, some more beneficial than others. But what we need now is actually targets. We need targets that are actually uh, attacked, are attached to particular functions that could be detrimental in these diseases. So maybe it is what is a target that the immune system has that is abnormal in all of these diseases. It could be a target that the vasculature has that means that the brain has more toxins or the retina has more toxins entering it. It could be a target that changes the susceptibility or decreases the susceptibility of those neurons that are dying to be uh, uh, killed or degenerated by these cells. There is a, a whole repertoire of very safe drugs that are available that we do not know if they are effective in a whole range of different neurodegenerative diseases. So one of the things that was very warming to hear the CFC4 team talk about was splitting their research in a, in a sort of thought experiment for what are the drugs that are available now that could be used to treat patients that have the disease now? And can we learn something to get to clinic very quickly? And then a second big question, what are new targets which would produce first-in-class therapies which don't exist, which will take us a decade or two to produce because obviously it takes a long time to do the biology, the chemistry, work with pharmaceutical industry and the FDA to make sure that those new therapies are safe for patients to take. And so this is a group of people that are thinking about this in a very sensible, very smart, very modern way to get the most rapid treatment to patients first and then the best treatment to patients after. And I think that was very, very smart. So Shane, that's a good uh, introduction to another question that has come up and that uh, Adriana, people are familiar with uh, your research on insulin. And I think that's an, uh, an interesting story uh, of how an existing drug and some good scientific observation and, and testing has led to, to a very interesting now uh, clinical trial. And, and I think it just points to the fact that thinking differently and bringing different ideas together can open up uh, new pathways. And it, would you share a little bit of the, the insulin story uh, for glaucoma? Yes, of course, Tom, thank you very much. So actually there's a long history in my lab where we have tried uh, a lot of drugs that uh, were already approved and in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease in glaucoma, and they turn out to be very effective in our animal models, but there was no interest to develop them commercially because they were either not, not patented or it was uh, the companies couldn't really make a profit on the development of those drugs. And that is something I want to mention because it really takes a lot of determination to, even though you have very good results in the laboratory, it takes determination and uh, alternative creative solutions to get some of these things to clinical trials. So with insulin, we started with the biology. We knew that insulin was activating downstream pathways that were promoting retinal ganglion cell regeneration. And then uh, once we saw that effect, it was only a matter of, of you know, common sense to think, well, insulin is already being used uh, for uh, diabetes and it is extremely safe. It's been used for over a hundred years. And how do we do these? How do we take these to glaucoma patients? And again, the problem with insulin is that it's, it's already, uh, it's a compound that uh, we cannot patent as, as a, as, a, as a group to use it for glaucoma. Uh, it's uh, uh, complicated. And so we were actually very lucky to, to collaborate with Jeff Goldberg at Stanford University, uh, who some of you know, he's uh, a member of the um, uh, Scientific Advisory Board for, and the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Catalyst for a Cure Team 3. And a, a 
tremendous, fantastic, outstanding clinician scientist in glaucoma. And Jeff, luckily enough, ha- was interested in testing this clinically. And I think his team at Stanford University has one of the best uh, prepared and best uh, setups to, to do uh, an extensive number of clinical trials. And so that is ongoing there. So it took, it took a, a combination of us uh, you know, promoting our discovery thanks to the Glaucoma Research Foundation as well, who actually funded uh, the initial aspects of this project uh, when we were starting to look at the role of insulin in glaucoma and also the interest of a very competent and uh, collegial clinician scientist like Dr. Goldberg to launch these clinical trials that are now ongoing. And uh, we are also, uh, through our colleagues in ophthalmology here at the University of Montreal and following on on, uh, Jeff uh, Goldberg's steps are now putting in a protocol to Health Canada to do some uh, tests here in uh, in Montreal. But it it is a complicated dynamics. You need a, a very good observation, but you need also to find alternatives to doing clinical trials in the case you don't have the support of a big pharmaceutical company and I think there's a lot of targets out there that have remained orphan uh, in the sense that they have never reached the clinic because uh, there appears to be no financial gain from, from these studies. So that, that, that's a topic for another webinar. <laughs> well, the, the, um, another topic I think could also be interesting to discuss a little bit here and again, it's the collaborative aspect. And, and both both of you have talked a lot about the fact that we're bringing people with these very different backgrounds together to solve a, an important, uh, really unmet need, uh, treatments uh, for and cures for these debilitating neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and I just wonder, as you think about this collaborative approach and bringing together these different uh, talents, how does that accelerate the process from, from your perspective? How does it make it um, more, uh, more likely to succeed? Let's put it that way. Um, would, would you care to comment a little bit about that? Uh, the, the benefits of, of, uh, uh, of a collaborative effort like the Catalyst for a Cure to, to uh, prevent neurodegeneration and, and cure it one day. Maybe I can jump in first, Adriana. Um... You know, this is something that uh, I personally feel very strongly about. I know Adriana and obviously Thomas and, and all members involved with uh, each iteration of CFCs has felt strongly about, you know, we individually cannot address everything. And, and if we only ever interact with people who have been trained by us, like us, have the same background as us, use the same techniques as us, um, we're never going to find these novel uh, approaches or novel insights into really complex problems like neurodegeneration. This is the same outside of biology, in engineering, in computation, and things like this. You need people with diverse training and diverse backgrounds together. And I think we have, with CFC4, got one of the most diverse uh, teams of people together so that they can actually bring together their disparate expertise to help overcome the problems that they may each have within their field. So, you know, we know that clinicians have difficulty sometimes with having the time to do the research and having the model to do the research because patients are so variable. This is one of the joys of working with human patients is their variability, but that can make it very difficult to understand the biology uh, and make new treatments. And so having people uh, who have expertise in Uh, cell-based assays and um, um, biological assays that we're using in the laboratory so that they can dig very, very deep into the mechanisms of these diseases is really, really important. Um, Also having not just what we would call wet lab people, that is people who are doing experiments with reagents and pipettes and wearing lab coats and things, but that generates a lot of data. And quite often you need serious expertise, computational expertise, statistical expertise, to make sense of all that high quality data that you're generating. And so that's why we have this very uh, diverse group uh, of research scientists, but also from diverse backgrounds together. I think it's gonna be very powerful. I can say just speaking personally, um, that all of the best science that my lab has done 
has been in collaboration with people that don't do what we do um, because you think about the problem differently, you bring new expertise to the table, and you can overcome those hurdles much, much more quickly rather than banging your head against the brick wall trying to work out why this is not working. Uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. Adriana, I don't know if you want to comment more on that, but this is, you know, every great um, scientific discovery has come and been born out of these sorts of collaborations. Absolutely, Shane. I couldn't agree more with you. And I think you've said it all. It's all about collaboration to get to the big breakthroughs. And I think we, the, the new team is very aware of that and they know that uh, what we are, they're, they're aiming for couldn't be achieved independently in the individual lab, so they have to work together. And that has been the model for the Catalyst for Cure teams in the past, and it has been a successful model, but in this case, is even more critical. And I think they understand that and uh, it will be great to see what they can achieve together. Adriana, I think you make a, a really important point there and something that has been a part, as you said, of Catalyst for a Cure from the very beginning. And that is uh, for the scientists not to do what they already know how to do and could do, but to do something that benefits from the group collaborative effort so that the whole idea and, and kind of, I think, what we've tried to, to challenge, what you as the advisors have really tried to challenge them is, don't look at this as just another grant to support the work that's ongoing in your lab, but look at it as an opportunity to do something totally different that you probably would have never even thought of if it weren't for the other members of the team. So it's that active real-time collaboration, not waiting for papers to be published and not waiting for meetings, but really, and as, as you saw at that meeting on Friday, we put them together, gave them two hours and said, okay, tell us what you're going to do, right? And, and they did. So it was pretty impressive. But I think, um, you know, it's hard. It's risky. It's risky to do what we're doing. And consequently, it isn't often funded. And that's why we're so indebted to philanthropists and to our donors, because frankly, if you send an application to the National Institutes of Health to put together the team we put together, it could never be funded. They wouldn't even know where to send it because these are such diverse uh, talents. Um, so it takes a, an organization that's willing to invest in a risky enterprise but the good news is we've been doing it now for 20 years and we've gotten outstanding results in each one of our catalysts for a cure. So uh, it's an exciting time to see what this new group will come up with. Um, so I, uh, I think at this point, we really um, you know, have exhausted most of the questions that have come in. Um, I would say, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Adriana or Shane, if you have any closing remarks um if you any last comments you'd like to make before we uh wrap it up but i'll, I'll just give it back to you for for a comment maybe i'll just uh tom i'll take advantage of the what you said just now which is to emphasize how important it is to have these nonprofit organizations fund these seed projects and and projects that have such a as you mentioned high risk focus because uh, the results are going to be high payoff and they are not going to be funded through uh, normal channels. So I want to thank all, all the donors that are here today joining us to learn about this initiative. Um, thank you for your vision to, to be able to uh, allow these type of projects and initiatives to move forward. It's very important to break ground on very difficult problems because most of the big agencies just fund things that are so, so, so safe. And they have been practically done already. So to, to fund something really innovative without what we're going to know, have idea what we're going to find, it uh, takes a lot of courage and a lot of risk. And that is really a, a wonderful sign that this is very healthy at the Glaucoma Research Foundation, and, and uh, this entrepreneurship is, is really uh, providing so many opportunities for fantastic, uh, high quality and breakthrough research. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. And 
I, I'm going to agree with everything. And I just wanted to add, you know, my thanks as well to everyone on the, on the, on the call who has been a supporter of projects like this or other research uh, projects over the years. You know, one of the things that was very apparent listening to CFC4s, you know, one of the very first questions they asked us was, can we collaborate with other people outside the CFC? They wanted to involve more people. They wanted to see this as not only them working in isolation in a silo, but their work and their discoveries as a seed for an entire community of researchers across all sorts of different um, disease silos across all sorts of techniques, parts of biology, and they didn't see themselves as the end of this problem. They saw them as a piece in the puzzle and tried to work out not only how they could succeed, but also how they could benefit other researchers in addition to benefiting patients as well. And that, as Adriana said, not only is this the sort of research that traditional funders wouldn't fund because it is high risk, they also tend not to fund sorts of research that is, we are going to help not only patients, but also the community of researchers and help with outreach and help with teaching. And that's what this CFC4 team started talking about almost immediately, which was incredibly warming to see. Um, so I, I have really high hopes. I'm excited I get to be along for the ride just a little bit. Uh, I want to collaborate with them all as well because they're all fantastic. Um, so this is an absolute pleasure. And, and I thank you all for your support. This is really a groundbreaking um, sort of way to do research. Well, thank you, Shane, and thank you, Adriana, so much for being part of our effort here to uh, cure, uh, prevent and cure neurodegenerative diseases like glaucoma and Alzheimer's. Um, I really wanna thank you and I wanna thank our participants for joining us today for your interest and support. And um, if we were unable to answer your questions today, please visit our website www.glaucoma.org or our many social media platforms for the latest information about glaucoma and our research, and certainly to follow the progress of this newest Catalyst for a Cure. The Catalyst for a Cure continues to demonstrate the incredible power of philanthropy, as you heard so well from Adriana and Shane. Our donors really do not only make the work possible, but inspire us by supporting these innovative projects. And your ongoing investment, your enthusiasm and dedication are really critical. Thank you once again for being here with us and for joining us in our bold vision of a future free from glaucoma. Because of your continued partnership, the cure is truly in sight.